somebody uh, said to me yesterday, uh, see, you've, you've been to the sun. Um, and I said, well, yes, I, I was in the sun, actually. I was away for a week uh, where there was sun every day. But I said, I, I got this burnt face, actually, at Portrush because uh, I, I sneaked off on Friday up to the uh, Irish Open Gulf. A friend had asked me months ago, would I like to go with him? It seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, when I saw the forecast, I began to have second thoughts, but I went up anyway, and uh, it was a really, really great day. Uh, sell-out crowds, uh, no tickets left, and the uh, place was, was full of people. And I assume that everybody who was present at the Irish Open Golf Championship had an interest in the sport of golf. That's why they were there. Some people would have been people who played golf, maybe were good at it. Uh, others just maybe liked to watch it. I have to confess that I have a set of clubs. Uh, I was going to take them back because they don't work. Um, I might play four or five times in the year a, a game of golf, and it's usually Ballyer or, or somewhere like that. But I do enjoy playing, and I enjoy watching. But whenever a group of people get together, it's true, isn't it, that the reason that they're there is because of some common interest that they have. Their presence really is a statement, isn't it, about themselves. If they go to a class, then they're interested in that subject. If they meet with members of a club, then they are involved in that particular activity. If they go to a concert, then they like whoever's playing or taking part. In other words, the fact that they're there tells us that there is some connection between them and what is actually taking place. Now, it's exactly the same, isn't it, when we come to communion. When you and I later in the service take of the Lord's table, we are saying something about ourselves, aren't we? We're celebrating all that this supper pictures and all that it speaks of. And essentially, we're stating, aren't we, that our confidence before God is not in ourselves and what we do, but rather in what God has done for us and in his mercy that is extended to us in Jesus Christ. That's really, I suppose, what lies at the core or heart of what it is to be a Christian. And to help us to think about that, I want just to look for a moment or two at a, a couple of verses in 1 Peter chapter 2 that were read earlier on in the service. Now, you will be aware probably that the, the Christians that Peter is writing to are suffering. That's a thread that runs through this letter. They are under pressure. They're being persecuted. They're finding things difficult. And Peter is trying to encourage them and urge them on to live for Jesus Christ. And he talks about Christ as the example. And when he was insulted and abused, he did not retaliate. And then at the end of that chapter, we have what I think we can only call a little gem, a treasure of truth that really, I, I believe, is a summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want to look at those two verses, verses 24 and 25, and draw out two truths that I trust will help us as we come to the Lord's table. These two verses tell us what God does for us. It's what God does for us. And Peter makes it clear. He talks about our sins, about us, and about you. So he's including himself, and he's talking about the church of Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now, if any sentence was a summary of evangelical doctrine, I suppose this would be it. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Now, what are those sins? Well, I think they're different for all of us, aren't they? We have some people who would, we, we would probably say we're down and out. We have those who we sometimes call those are up and out. But essentially, it tells us in verse 25 what sin is. The beginning of that verse says, For you were like sheep going 
astray. That's essentially what sin is. It is saying no to God. It is pushing God away. It is saying, I will live my life my way. I will please myself. I will live for me. I will have no concern for your standards or your glory or what you want for me. We were like sheep going astray. And of course, that shows itself in different ways in different people's lives, doesn't it? But in essence, it is about going astray from God. And maybe you can remember back to that time when when you were going astray. And it, it produced different kinds of manifestations in your life. I wonder if Peter had in mind when he wrote these words that awful day. You remember after all of his boasting and all of the claims that he made and he said to Jesus, you can rely on me. If these guys don't stand by you, I'll be there. And then, of course, the Bible tells us when the moment of truth came, Peter denied Jesus. He cursed. He said he didn't know him. And the scripture tells us that Jesus looked at him and Peter went out and wept bitterly. I wonder if that was in in Peter's mind. And of course, sin must be paid for. The Bible tells us, doesn't it, the soul that sins will die. And all of us are on death row. We've been sentenced and there's nothing we can do about it. Every appeal has failed. And then God steps in, doesn't he? And Christ takes our place. He carries our penalty in his body on the cross. He becomes the righteous substitute for the unrighteous. This is the amazing truth of the gospel. Good news, it's called, and so it is. The guilty go free. We're spared. The sentence is canceled. And we're treated as if we are innocent. The reason is because the Son of God bore our sins in his body on the tree. It's a great message. It's wonderful to be able to go to people who have lived far from God and been in the deepest pit and say to them, listen, it doesn't matter. If you are willing to come to him, he is willing to forgive you. You don't have to climb your way and work your way up to him. God will reach down and lift you and receive you and accept you. It's a wonderful message. That's what we celebrate. It speaks of our hope in the sight of a holy God. And as we take the Lord's Supper today, let's remember what it meant for Jesus Christ to do this. You remember perhaps the name of Sam Hallam. He was convicted uh, eight years ago of a murder and he was sentenced to prison and he went to spend, I don't know how many years, but a long time locked away. And then the evidence was revisited, discovered that he was many, many miles away from where that crime took place and his conviction was overturned. And he was set free just this year after seven years in prison. Can you imagine how awful it would be to sit in a prison cell being punished for something that you knew you did not do? Nobody would listen to you. Nobody would plead your case. Wouldn't that be horrendous? Well, let's remember it's only a fraction, if we can even glimpse at it, it's only a fraction of what the Savior went through. Because remember, here was a man of total obedience. Verse 22 says he committed no sin and no deceit was in his mouth. He lived among sin and yet he was untouched by sin. It would have been bad enough for him to come to this planet that was polluted by iniquity, but infinitely worse wasn't it for him to take the sins of people like you and me on himself. And it stares us in the face, doesn't it? Because it says he bore his own, our sins in his body on the tree. That was the cross. Crucifixion was reserved for the worst of criminals. Only an awful crime resulted in the death of crucifixion. 
And when you hung on that cross, everybody who walked by assumed that you had done something terrible. Christ was flanked by two gangsters dying the death of the wicked. You see, that's the way it was in the sight of God. In the Old Testament, whenever someone was stoned to death, if they were exceptionally evil, their body was hung on a tree and they were considered to be under a curse. And in the eyes of God, Jesus is guilty of every sin under the sun, every immorality, every abuse, every act of wickedness. It's no wonder that Jesus cried, why have you forsaken me? Friends, let's remember that's what God did for us. It's a terrible price to pay so that you and I might be set free. The hymn writer summed it up when he said, He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. It tells us what Christ does for us. But it also tells us, and more briefly, what Christ does in us. He bears our sin, and when that happens, something takes place within our hearts and our souls. There's a change that happens. And what causes that change? Well, verse 25 tells us, you were going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That reminds us, doesn't it, that God searched for us and he found us and he called us and brought us home. And when we come to Christ, we're restored to our creator. We're brought back to where we belong. And we're united in a relationship with the living God. We're bound to him. We're joined to him in saving faith. And we have fellowship with him. It says in verse 24, by his wounds you have been healed. Our condition is changed. Once we were in possession of eternal death, but through him we receive life. And what happens? Well, it shows itself, doesn't it, in our desires. What's the result? Well, there's a process that begins. It's ongoing, and he tells us what it is. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So that's what happens in us. God creates a new longing deep in our souls to live those, out those things that please him and that bring glory to him. It's just a little bit like marriage, I often think. Whenever you, somebody gets married, well, you're married. And you're joined to the other person. But you've got to learn what it means to live a married life what will please the person that you're married to. If you're a man, how you can stay in the good books and how you can do things that are appreciated and helpful. You've got to learn to love. So when we make our vows together, we're married, we're joined, but then we work out what it means to live in that relationship. And so it is in the Christian life that when we come to faith in Christ, our sins are borne away. Our wounds have been are healed by his wounds. And we begin to love those things that are true. That we die to sin and live to righteousness. So let's remember, as we come to the Lord's table, we're, we're making a statement. We're saying that we belong to the Savior. That's where our trust is and our hope is. But we're also saying that we're striving to live a life of godliness. We're pursuing holiness. We're earnestly waging war against sin. We're saying that we have a hunger for righteousness that we're seeking to feed. 
We're learning how we ought to live. We're seeking to deny ourselves. Now, of course, let me remind you, we are not depending on those things to qualify us. Our confidence in coming to the table is not in our achievements. It's in the fact that we belong to the Savior. But when we do, this is also true. And it's something that we do from our heart. There's no coercion. Nobody's forcing us. It is our heart's desire because we've been brought back to him and we have been healed by him. And the Lord's table gives us an opportunity, doesn't it, to renew our resolve, to die to sin and to live to righteousness. There are times when we're more successful at that than others. There are seasons where we perhaps feel we make more progress than we do at others. But it's our constant goal, isn't it? It's what we long for. We love to please the one to whom we belong. And as we seek to do that, here's our assurance. The end of that chapter. We have returned to the shepherd who cares for us, provides for us, loves us, promises us eternal life that we will never perish. And he's the overseer of our souls, who watches over us, whose eye is upon us, who guards us and keeps us and ensures that one day, by his grace, we will celebrate that great supper in the kingdom of